down in their heart, they are not really convinced that he's coming soon. Even though that they know that uh, theologically, I must believe that. I mustn't, I must talk about it because spiritual people say that the Lord is coming soon. So I want to be known as a spiritual person. So I shall say the Lord is coming soon. But if he, die, if he is, it would change our whole attitude towards many things on earth. Well, whether we know it or not, the devil knows the Lord is coming soon. He knows he's only got a short time left before his reign is over. And because of that, his anger is great. His anger is great, especially against, it says in verse 17 of this chapter, Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with whom? The rest of her offspring, that's referring to the church. That is, it's defined as those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. If you're a compromiser, you don't keep God's commandments exactly, um, you can be happy. The devil's not very angry with you. But if you're one of those wholehearted disciples of Jesus who's determined to keep every commandment of God, you're in that privileged number of those whom the devil is angry with. I don't want the devil to be happy with me. The devil to write me off and say, oh well, he's not going to be a threat to my kingdom. I'll tell you honestly, he's written off lots and lots of believers. Ah, I know what they live like. Don't worry about them. He tells the demons, they're not going to harm me. They're not going to harm our kingdom. Well, watch out for this guy and watch out for that guy and watch out for that person. Watch out for that sister. They're dangerous. The devil's fury. It's a great honor if the devil's enraged with you. I want the devil to be enraged with me. I want to be furious with me. Mainly because he knows I'm not scared of him. That's what enrages him even more. That I have such confidence in Christ. I believe with all my heart that the one who lives in me is greater than the one who lives in the world. I think of the, the Israelites who came to the borders of Canaan. And ten of the spies looked at the giants and looked at themselves and they said, we're like grasshoppers. In, you read that in Numbers 13. We're like grass, we look like grasshoppers in the presence of these Canaanite giants. And there were two, Joshua and Caleb, who we can say looked at the giants and then looked at God and said, these giants look like grasshoppers. So I find that there are two types of Christians. Those who got a huge devil, they, a grasshopper like Jesus living in their heart. And there are other Christians who got a huge Christ living in their heart and a grasshopper like devil hopping around. Which category are you? If you're afraid of something the devil can do to you, you got a grasshopper Jesus. That's another Jesus. Um, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And it says here in Revelation 12, 11 about such people. They overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb so that he could never put any guilt on them concerning their past. And by the word of their testimony, they spoke to the devil. Do you speak back to the devil when he tempts you? Jesus did it all the time. When the devils told him something, he would quote God's word back to him. And every time the devil changed tactic, tried something else, he'd quote another word, finally left him. If you want the devil to leave you, speak back to him. Talk to him. The word of your testimony. That's not the word of your testimony in the church. That's not the word of your testimony to other unbelievers. It's the word of your testimony to the devil. Very few Christians give their testimony to the devil. Every person whom I lead to the Lord in salvation I always tell them after they've received Christ as Lord into their life, repented of their sins and confessed their faith in Christ risen and dead and resurrected, I tell them then to tell the devil that you were defeated on the cross, Satan, 
My Savior defeated you. He came in the flesh and overcame. And I don't belong to you anymore. You can't touch me. I encourage them to say that and to say I renounce every contact I ever had with you in my past life, knowingly or unknowingly. I encourage them to renounce it in Jesus' name. So that there's no hangover of the past and they recognize that Satan was defeated because the two things that happened on the cross, at least two things in many, among many others. One, he died for our sins. Colossians 2.14, he took away the certificate of debt, tore it up. And the second, Colossians 2.15, he took away the armor of Satan against us. He defeated Satan on the cross, made him powerless. Hebrews 2.14, and if we confess most Christians only confess one thing that Jesus did on the cross. He died for my sins. How many Christians have you heard confess he defeated Satan on the cross? It's very, very important. I myself was not taught in the early days. I grew up in a brethren assembly where they never talked about the devil and they never talked about the Holy Spirit. So I didn't know what to do. I didn't know about this realm of the heavenlies where Satan's active till I was filled with the Holy Spirit and then it, it became very real to me the whole realm of satanic activity and the authority that I had over Satan do you know that the Holy Spirit when he fills you will bring you into a realm where you know you have authority over Satan and after it's only after that that I realized I have to teach people to do this I remember one a lady who came to our home once and I told her to say this and she turned around to me with another voice and said I was not defeated on the cross and only I realized she was demon possessed and we cast the demon out of her that took only about five seconds and then I said to her tell the devil now he was defeated on the cross and she could say it easily could tell the devil you were defeated on the cross that's the day I learned something that the devil does not like to be reminded that he was defeated on the cross. And I decided to remind him as often as I could. And I decided to teach other people to remind him as often as he, they could that he was defeated on the cross. Amen. Are you ashamed to confess that Christ died for your sins? That all your sins are forgiven? We should say it by the blood of the Lamb. We overcome Satan. We also need to give a testimony to him that he was defeated on the cross. I encourage all of you to do it. It will make you tremendously brave against Satan. It says in 2 Corinthians 2. In the military, soldiers are taught to know the tactics of Satan, of the enemy. In our case, Satan. But in every warfare, in all war, you need to know what, if you can know what the enemy is going to do, you're more prepared for war than if you do not know what the enemy is going to do. That's why military intelligence is a major part of warfare. And that's, we can apply that to the Christian war with Satan. Intelligence, to know what is Satan going to do. In fact, all modern warfare is based on intelligence. Uh, protect, protecting a country from terrorist attacks is mostly based on intelligence. Otherwise you wait till something gets blown up and then you discover it. But intelligence can stop it. It's the same here. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. We don't want any advantage to be taken of us by Satan. We are not ignorant of his schemes. It's one of the wonderful privileges in the new covenant is to be aware of Satan's schemes, his tactics. If you know his tactics, you can save your children from being taken over by him. You can protect your wife, you can protect your family, you can protect your finances, you can protect your life, your church. But if you don't believe in Intelli in um, military intelligence in this spiritual warfare you can wait till he comes and creates the havoc and then you wake up it's like waiting till the terrorists have blown up something and then you go and try and 
find where they are. But if you have intelligence, you can stop the thing being blown up. And every sensible country believes that's better than catching the terrorists after they have blown up something. But I tell you, you may discover later on that that's how this country has been protected from a lot of attacks in the last 10 years because of intelligence. We can learn something from that. Christians should be wiser. Jesus once said, these children of the world are wiser in their generation than the children of light. Have you, they make, they spend so much money, they employ so many spies, they spend millions of dollars only to get intelligence on the enemy. How much effort do you make to study the scriptures, the only book in the world that can give us intelligence on what Satan does, his schemes. And I tell you, his schemes have not changed much in all these 6,000 years of man's history. So if you study his schemes, not only in scripture, whenever I hear of some man of God or great preacher falling into sin or losing his testimony or becoming a backslider or being discovered to be a hypocrite or going after money or women or something like that, I always make careful inquiry concerning that person, not to criticize him, not to find fault with him, but to learn for myself. Lord, I have the same flesh as that man. And what happened to him can happen to me. I'm also a preacher. I also stand in the pulpit. I'm also a shepherd of God's people. And I know that such people are the targets of Satan more than all other believers. Because if he knows that he, he knows that if he can knock down one leader, he's shattered the faith of many people. So the devil guns for leaders. That's why the Bible says we must pray for the leaders. Because you don't realize how much Satan guns for them. I know that Satan's been, Satan's gun for me and my family. He attacks the families of leaders. That's why we need to pray for the families of Christian leaders. But we must know Satan's tactics. We're not here to judge others, but we can learn from the mistakes of others. So, I want to share a few things concerning that in these sessions. First of all, in Genesis chapter 3, where we read, first of all, of Satan's entry into the human race. The first time you, we see him in the Bible, he came, comes as a serpent. The Bible says he comes as a serpent. And in 1 Peter 5 it says he comes like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Serpent refers to his activity as a deceiver. And lion uh, refers to his activity as a persecutor. So there are two ways in which, basically two ways in which Satan has sought to attack the church through the years. By deception and persecution. And if you look through the history of the church, it's by deception and persecution that he's attacked as a serpent and as a lion. And through the years, Satan has discovered that deception is a better method than persecution. Because like they say, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And Satan has discovered that, that Killing Christians has not always succeeded in uh, reducing their number or killing the church. It has succeeded actually in purifying the church. Because in a time of persecution, all the weeds get pulled out. All the uh, false believers get fall away. The goats get separated from the sheep. And that's a very good thing for every church. So Satan's persecution only purifies the church. We've seen that everywhere. Why, why do you have some of the finest Christians in the world today? In China. Because there's persecution. And wherever there's been persecution, and look at the countries that are under communist rule. The Christians in those countries were far purer than they are today 
when they have got liberated from communism. It's true. Absolutely true. The Christians who fled from persecution, many of them from many countries, Russia and other countries, and who came to America, became worldly after coming here. They were fine Christians over there. The devil knows that persecution only purifies people. But he can ruin them with deception. And he does. He succeeded in that area. In Genesis chapter 3, Satan had the option of coming through a lion or through a serpent. The lion was the fiercest but it says here the serpent was the craftiest, Genesis 3 verse 1. And he chose the crafty one over the fierce one. I'm sure the roar of the lion was just as loud in Eden as it is today. And I've heard the roar of a lion in a zoo and I'm scared even with the bars on that cage. He could have come like that and frightened Adam and Eve. They would have run away from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And run away from the lion himself. But he was clever. He came as a serpent. Knew that there's, I'll succeed with deception. And that's how he comes today. We are not ignorant of Satan's schemes. And the first thing he did was to try and make them water down. The threats of God's word. Oh, it won't happen. No, it won't happen. Very first thing. Make them question the word of God. You know he's adopting the same method today. And he has succeeded with millions of believers today who don't know their Bibles. I've gone to so many churches, particularly in America, when nobody brings a Bible to the church. Nobody, I mean, there may be a few, less than 10%. I say, how is that? Are they so well versed in the scriptures that they don't even need the Bible? I mean, I still need a Bible and I go to church. No, it's, it's the tactic of Satan. Keep them ignorant of scripture. Then somebody on television or somewhere else can get up and quote a scripture and they won't even know whether it's in scripture. And they'll never become familiar with it. I remember we had the, uh, that's what he said to Eve. Has God really said, Genesis 3, 1, questioning the word of God. Supposing you got a word today from Satan. Has God really said that? You'd say, I don't know. I haven't read the Bible yet. You know, when in our church in Bangalore, we had the option of getting this software that could project verses on the screen every time a verse was quoted from the pulpit, just like we project songs on the screen. So I said, no, we'll never have it in our church. We won't have it in any of our churches. It'll just make everybody lazy. They won't bring their Bibles. And I want you to see the condition of believers who go to churches but they always have the verses projected on the screen. They don't know their Bibles. And I'll tell you this. I've got one of these pocket things like the cell phone type of thing with PDAs where I've got Bibles. It's good to have, use it as a concordance. But if that is the only Bible you use, I can guarantee in 10 years you won't know the scriptures. If you already know the scriptures, using that is okay, but think of the new generation coming up. People who use that all the time. You tell them to turn to the book of Zephaniah, they won't know where it is. They'll have to look at the contents page to find out where it is. They'll be ignorant. Do you know the scriptures? Just turn with me to Malachi chapter 5.
Do you find it? I was just trying to prove something to you. Get to know the Bible, brothers and sisters. Otherwise, I tell you, in these last days, Satan will get the advantage over you. Has God said, you must know what God has said. And you must know what God has not said. Sometimes he misquotes scripture. I remember seeing a leaflet put out by a certain preacher in India who called himself a prophet. And he, at the bottom of that, in that leaflet, he was talking about his ministry and all, just one page thing, was written, send your support to such and such an address, money, and this verse, he who gives to a prophet will receive the reward of a prophet, Matthew 10, 41. As soon as I saw it, I knew that verse was not in scripture. But it sounds like scripture, right? Because you know, it says something like that in Matthew, I know. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say anything about giving to a prophet. It says about giving a cup of cold water to someone who needs it, a little one. And it speaks about receiving a prophet into your home and honoring him. It doesn't say a word about giving money to a prophet. I saw there how easy it is for people to be deceived. Would it strike you if you saw that on a little tract or paper that that's not in the Bible? Has God said it? When you hear television evangelists preaching something, does it strike you? God didn't say that. It's so important, my dear brothers and sisters, don't be ignorant of Satan's schemes. He comes as an angel of light, the Bible says. His servants are servants of righteousness. They will preach righteousness, apparently. Do you know how legalism looks so much like true Christianity? Legalism looks so much like true holiness, but it isn't. It's a counterfeit. It's a front. It's meant to deceive people. Jesus hit out at the legalists of his day much more than anybody else. I never see him once condemning women caught in adultery or murderers hanging on a cross or even the five times divorced woman in Samaria. He was sure he hated all those sins. He never condoned adultery or murder or divorce. Never. But I don't see him condemning them because they were ignorant, they fell into sin and they had bad teachers. But boy, the way he condemned those legalists. In Jesus' eyes, legalism was worse than adultery. How many of you believe that? You'd be horrified if somebody called you an adulterer, adulteress. But if somebody call you legalist, it's not so serious. It's because you don't know the scriptures. You know the story of Jesus standing here, a woman caught in adultery here, and the legalist there, who know the scriptures, they even quote the reference. Moses said, such women must be stoned to death. And whose side does Jesus take in that story? Does he take the side of the woman caught in adultery? Or does he take the side of the legalist? Then you know which is more serious. Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. He said, oh yeah, sure, I know Moses said that. Go right ahead and do it. But he who is without sin, cast the first stone. And starting from the eldest, they went away. And you know, if somebody else had said that, somebody would have picked up a stone. 
But when Jesus said it, ah, they knew. If anybody tried to pick up a stone, Jesus would have made a list of that fellow's sins publicly and he would have been ashamed. They knew that. They couldn't play the fool with Jesus. They knew that he could see through them. He would list their sins and they all got scared and the eldest ran away first. And one by one they all left until there was only one man left in whom there was no sin who was qualified to throw stones. He could have picked up and obeyed the Old Testament law and killed the law which he himself gave Moses. The law which he himself gave Moses on Sinai. He could have taken it. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He doesn't take, he has no stones in his pockets. He doesn't throw stones at people like a lot of preachers do. A lot of preachers do that. They get into the pulpit and they, they want to fling a stone at somebody there. Some, they got something against somebody there and they got a verse to fling at that poor sister sitting there and a, a verse to sing, hit, fling at that brother. It's all stones. Jesus has no stones. He's not like these legalistic preachers. I don't, I'm not throwing stones at them because I was a legalistic preacher like that myself. I thank God I've been delivered. It's like saying I was an adulterer once but God delivered me. This is worse. It's a worse sin I'm confessing when I say I was a legalist once. But I got delivered. I'm not a recovering legalist like the addicts say. <laughs> Jesus delivered me completely. There are no half jobs with him. So, be careful. Direct no scripture that legalism is worse than adultery. I'd rather be called an adulterer than a legalist. I hope you see that. Does the Bible say that the letter kills? Yeah, it does. So that's the first thing. Cast a doubt on God's word. Will disobedience to scripture lead you to spiritual death or not? The devil says no. God says you will surely die if you eat from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the day that you eat of that tree, you will die. You will surely die. Genesis 2.17. There's no doubt about it. You will surely die. And the devil says in Genesis 3, 4, you will surely not die. Do you see how bold he is? Contrast Genesis 2, 17. You will surely die with Genesis 3, 4. You surely will not die. You say, well, we don't have the tree of knowledge of good and evil today. Right. I'll show you another verse that God has said. Romans 8, verse 12. Romans 8 is written to believers who have come past chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Come past justification by faith, victory over sin, freedom from the law, and come into life in the spirit in chapter 8. To such believers, to such believers, he writes, So then, brethren, brethren, whom does Paul call brethren? Born again believers. We are under no obligation to the flesh to live according to the flesh. If you live according to the flesh, you will surely die. Brethren, born again believers, you will die spiritually, you'll be eternally lost if you live according to the flesh. And we have got all these theologians in Christendom today who say, you surely will not die. Remember that day 10 years ago when you said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart? You will surely not die. Who was right in Eden? God or Satan? Who is right today? Paul or these modern theologians? You can have your choice. I stand with God and with Paul. Do you know the multitudes of people who have gone to hell today because they were given a false assurance of salvation that you would never die. 
you shall surely not die. Forget Romans 8.13 which says you will surely die. You brethren, you surely will not die. It's the same old devil. I know he's enraged with me because I'm teaching these truths openly everywhere I go. He's got a lot of his agents in Christendom enraged with me too. Christian believers who don't like it. They say that's heresy. I say that's heresy. Is what the devil's saying heresy or is what God's word saying heresy? Which do you think is heresy? When God's word says you live according to the flesh, brethren, you will die. Or when the devil says, no, 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 you said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. You said those magic words a few years ago, you won't die. I'm not asking whether you just believe it. Are you doing everything in your power to deliver other believers who believe this rubbish from spiritual death? Otherwise, their blood is on your hands. I believe that. If anybody in my church or wherever I have responsibility does not hear this truth from me of Romans 8.13, their blood will be on my hands. And I want to charge all of you with the same charge like Paul told Timothy. I charge you in the presence of Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead. You have a responsibility to make sure that the people you know who are living under this deception that once they accepted the Lord they can live as they like. That's the first thing. You will question God's word. And in many, many areas, that's just one example. If you know the word, you will know the deception of Satan. If you don't know the word, or you try to be gracious with people, well, you can be graciously send people to hell, you know that. I'd rather be firm with them even if they get angry with me. I'd rather use strong words when I see a man on a house on, sleeping in a cot in a house on fire, sleeping on his bed. And I say, will you please get up, sir? The house is on fire and he doesn't hear me. I yell at him. Get up. He still doesn't hear. I push the bed over and knock him down. He gets angry with me. I say, just have a look and see why I tried to do that to you. Oh, thank you so much. Do you love people that much? Or you want to be gracious? Sir, the house is on fire. What to do? He doesn't listen to me. You don't love him at all. Don't deceive yourself that you love those people. You'd rather let him burn. I love him too much to be disturbed just because he'd get angry with me for telling him the truth. We're not ignorant of Satan's schemes. If you live according to the flesh, you'll die. You'll surely die. And the devil fooled Eve. The result didn't come immediately. It says in Ecclesiastes, there's a lovely verse there, <clears throat> a frightening verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. Because the punishment against an evil deed is not executed immediately, therefore the hearts of people are given fully to do evil. You know why people continue to do evil? Because they believe the devil's lie. Not only that um, they can be lost, but yeah, God won't take that so seriously. That's what he was implying in his, when he was telling Eve, God's not, remember God's a loving God. He's not going to send anybody to hell. All this stuff that Jesus spoke about people burning with the worms forever and all, yeah, don't take it seriously. He doesn't really mean it. Jesus told a few lies, by the way. Well, that's what you're saying if you don't believe in an eternal hell. <clears throat> Nobody preached about hell like Jesus did because he knew the reality of it. I remember reading <clears throat> in the biography of Salvation of William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. He used to train people. I mean, he had tremendous passion for evangelism and to save people from eternal damnation. And he had these training courses for those who were called the Salvation Army soldiers in England. And after their period of training was over, whether it, I don't know how long it was, six months or one year or whatever it was, 
he'd say, he said, I wish I could, at the end of the course, suspend each one of these trainees over hell for 24 hours and see people suffering in hell for 24 hours and then send them out to preach. Yeah, I believe what Jesus said totally about hell. It's not just that I don't want to go there. I don't want any of my children to go there. I have grandchildren now. I've started praying for them. I don't want them to go there. I don't want anybody in my church to go there. I've said to people in our church, we don't want one child to be lost in any of the families in our church. Not one. We're going to pray and fight for them just like Moses said to Pharaoh, we will not leave our children behind in Egypt. Are you going to leave your children behind in Egypt? Moses said, I will not even look, leave a cow's hoof behind in Egypt. I'm going to take it all out. If you want to do that, you've got to take scripture seriously. I think also, <clears throat> here there was an implication that God didn't love you. Turn to Genesis 3 verse 5. The devil said to Eve, he's, you know, once you start listening to the devil, he'll carry on, he'll carry on the conversation. That's why Jesus never carried on any conversation with demons. I've seen some people today who, when they're trying to cast out demons, they carry on conversation with them. I've never done it. I'm not interested in talking to them. Just cast them out with a word and they go. And here, once Eve started talking to the devil, the devil carries on. He loves to converse with people. God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be blessed in an amazing way. It's like he tells the people who take drugs, you're going to get a kick out of it. He tells the alcoholics, you'll get a kick out of drinking that. You'll get something, you'll, you'll, you'll really be benefited. He tells people who get angry with others, don't you want to get that off your chest? Give that person a piece of your mind, whether it's your wife or your neighbor, you'll feel a little relieved at the end of it. And you know from past experience, you do feel a relief when you have yelled at somebody. And I said, that was right. But you don't think of the long-term consequences. That's the thing. You'll be like God. You will know what's good and evil. Supposing he had also told her, but I also want to tell you, Eve, that you're going to spend the next 900 years fighting with your husband. Your first son will be a murderer. He'll kill your second son. And there's going to be a lot of chaos, confusion, sickness, and gives her a whole history of 6,000 years of all her children. You know, we're all children of Eve, by the way. This is how your children and grandchildren are going to suffer with sicknesses and blind babies born and AIDS and leprosy and all this is going to happen. But you're going to enjoy yourself now for five minutes. Think of that. You're going to enjoy yourself for five minutes. Don't worry about all this in the future. Do you think she'd have taken it? Never. That's the tactic of Satan. He does not tell you the long-term consequences of this five minutes of pleasure. Whether it's adultery or pornography or any sin. Supposing the devil tells somebody who's trying to sneak a view of Pornography on the computer when nobody's around. And the devil says, just five minutes. I tell you, you'll get a, such a thrill out of it like you've never experienced it. And then he gives you a taste for it. It's like animals when they taste blood, human blood. They are deadly after that. And you get a taste of that and you want to go to it again. And then one day you may give it up. Okay, but the devil won't tell you that even after you've given it up, even if you're born again, for the next 30 years, you'll be plagued with dirty dreams, even after you're born again. 
because you spend so many hours filling your mind with this trash. Will you be forgiven? Oh yes, you'll all be forgiven. But your mind will be plagued and plagued and plagued with dirty dreams and filthy stuff. You'll be polluted, all that pollution inside because you know God doesn't blot out our memory when he blots out our sins. I hope you know that. You can remember today all the major sins you committed in your life even if it was 50 years ago. And when you see a movie which has got a 10-15 second sex scene in it, three hour movie with 15 seconds of sex, I can guarantee that 10 years later you'd have forgotten the whole story of the movie but you'll remember the 15 seconds of sex. Do you think the devil will remind you of that? No. He'll say it's only 15 seconds. Ah, but that's the 15 seconds you're going to remember for the next 30 years. You'd completely forget the story in the movie. There are many, many other areas. You know, a little bit of cheating, a little bit of credit card debt. The devil says, well, you can always pay it back. You need it. You can't live without that gadget. All the advertisements that keep telling us that. I say to people, tell that advertisement, man lived without that for 5,000 years. I can live without it. You need it now. You can't wait another three years when you'll be able to afford it. Buy it on the credit card now. And is he going to tell you that you'll get into a habit of getting things that you can't afford? It's all on your credit card. And you keep paying the interest and the interest and the interest on it till you're plagued with debt. And you have fights at home, husband and wife, because of that. And you never know how to clear it in your mind instead of being on God's word. is so much on money, 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 money. How can I clear this debt? Because in the beginning, you would not take the word of God seriously. Which says in Romans 13 verse 8, Owe no man anything. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. If you want to have a debt to somebody, it must be a debt of love. That we have to have forever. Now don't misunderstand me. If you've got a mortgage on your house, that's not a debt. You take a weighing balance, you put the money you took from the bank, and you put a house on the other side, the weighing balance is level. There's no debt there. If you die, your wife can get rid of the house and you're free from debt. If you took a loan on a car and the car is insured, the car gets totaled and crashed, your debt is paid by the insurance. You're not in debt. But it's the other things that you buy and spend on which have no value after you bought it or its value drops immediately as soon as you buy it or you spend on a vacation that you feel you must go. Who said you must go? Do you know the millions of believers in the world who never have a vacation in their lives? I remember in the years when we were in India, my wife and I probably had two vacations in our whole life. <laughs> That's about it. We didn't suffer. It's the devil who fools you. Well, I say, if we can afford it, we do it. If you can't afford it, we say, it's not necessary. But you say, everybody in America does it. So what? I'll do it if I can afford it. If I can't afford it, I won't do it. I'll make my children happy at home. Entertain them in other ways. And if they say, but dad, those others are doing it. Yeah, son, they can afford it. God hasn't given us so much money, so we can't afford it. We give thanks for what we have and love one another. We'll be happy. But do you think the devil tells people, all this will happen if you once get onto this Start paying interest to the credit card companies. That's the thing, brothers and sisters, it could be many, many other areas. God knows. He doesn't really love you. That's why he's withheld that from you. Look at this lovely fruit. Why doesn't God want you to have it? He doesn't love you. Would a loving God keep such lovely fruit from you from tasting it? 
He comes to people today. Why didn't he answer that prayer? You prayed for your child and the child died. God doesn't love you. He doesn't have time for you. He's too busy with other things. That thing you prayed so much you wanted so badly, he never gave it to you. It's because he doesn't love you. If once the devil has succeeded in putting a, a seed into your mind, that a doubt about God's love, I tell you, it'll begin to become a huge tree. It'll pollute you, it'll pollute your home. You'll pass on that spirit of unbelief to your children. And your children will grow up with unbelief in a loving father. Just because something happened in your life which you couldn't explain. Well, I'll tell you a million things I can't explain. And I'll tell you the reason why I can't explain it. Because the wisdom of God is like a mighty ocean. And my mind is like a little cup. And I'm sorry, it cannot contain the ocean. It can contain only a wee little bit of it. Everything necessary for me to live a godly life, that I have. But the answers to why God does this and why God does that, I don't know. Why, why are children born blind? Why are children born with AIDS when their parents committed sin? Why are there so many beggars and tramps and people with leprosy in a country like India? So many questions like this, I can answer in three words. I don't know. But I will know one day, I see through a glass darkly, one day I will know everything. Today my knowledge is incomplete and I'm not ashamed to admit it. But I have faith in one thing that never changes, that my father is a loving father, God's a loving God, that never changes. I can't explain so many things, I'll tell you. I see believers suffering. I say, Lord, I don't understand this. Why? You could speak a word and that person would be okay right now. I've even thought if Jesus were physically here, he would touch that child and heal it. He would touch that brother who's got cancer and heal him. He'd get out of bed and walk out healthy. I, I know people have asked me this. I say, I don't know. But one thing I know, God is love. That nothing can shake my faith in that fact. And I want to say to you, be absolutely established on this truth. There are many things you will not be able to explain why it happens, why believers suffer, why God didn't protect that believer from that accident. I don't know. And I'm not here to judge whether they had faith or not faith. That's not my business. And a person who is sick, I will not go and torture that person even more by saying, you don't have faith. I say, God loves you, brother. God loves you. In spite of the fact that we can't explain why he's allowing you to go through so much pain and suffering, be sure of one thing, God loves you. Why has God allowed you to lose your job and you're struggling financially? I don't know, but one thing I'll tell you, and I have proved this for 35 years in a poor country like India where there's no social security, no food stamps, and um, people are very poor. I have seen in the poorest of villages in India that where I have taught people to seek God's kingdom first and his righteousness and live holy lives, God has made sure that their earthly needs are met. I have never seen a single case of failure till today. It's 100% a success rate when it comes to Matthew 6.33 in a poor country like India. It works. It works in the 21st century. It works in the poorest of countries. But if a person has expensive tastes and, well, then <laughs> he's going to cause trouble for himself. But if he says, Lord, I'm quite happy with little, I'm happy to live simply and just take care of me and my wife and children. I want to seek your kingdom first. I can promise you, anyone sitting here, I don't care what the circumstances are around. I don't care whether it's a recession or a depression. It makes no difference. These things make no difference to God. He runs the universe. The silver and the gold are his. 
The cattle on a thousand hills are his. He says in the Psalms, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. We must trust in a heavenly father. Eve did not have the revelation we have of Jesus dying on the cross, manifesting the love of God. How much Jesus labored to teach his disciples about a loving father. This is one of the major things he came on earth to do. Many of you are great Bible students. I want to ask you a question. What is a command that is repeated three times in the Sermon on the Mount? Three times in the Sermon on the Mount. In the space of about ten verses. I don't know if there's any place in scripture. I haven't checked it up where you have three, a command repeated three times in the space of ten verses. And that in the Sermon on the Mount. Wasn't saying it once enough. By the way, it was not don't get angry, that's a serious sin. It was not, don't lust after women. It was not, let your yes be yes. Do not be anxious. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Verse 25, do not be anxious. Verse 31, do not be anxious. Verse 34, do not be anxious. The same God who said, do not commit adultery, said, do not be anxious. The same God who said, do not commit murder, said, do not be anxious. The same God who said, do not steal, said, do not be anxious. Is one command more important than the other? Why is it that we who will never ever commit murder, never ever commit adultery, never ever steal even one cent from anybody, can be anxious day after day after day after day after day. Because we have heard the lie of the devil which he whispered to Eve. God doesn't really love you. He doesn't have time for you. You think he's listening to your prayer? It just goes to the roof. He's not listening. This, these are the words of Jesus himself. And it's interesting that he felt necessary to repeat it three times. You say, but what to do, brother? I'm the anxious type. Well, that's because you've been listening to the devil so long. It's like the other brother who says, what to do, brother? Every day I get dirty dreams. That's because for 20 years you watched pornography. There's a reason behind it all. But you can change it. You can change it. Fill your mind with God's word now. The picture the Lord gave me about this many years ago, which I've shared with young people, is your mind is like a bowl of water. It was clean when you were born. But you put so much filth into it that it's become like dirty, dirty. You can't, it's not clear at all. It's dirt and muck. And I can't access it. I can't empty that bowl. It's there. But my mind has got a limited capacity. And... I can do something, even if I can't access it, I can pour into it clean water. So think of a bowl full of dirty water. And I take a jug full of clean, pure water, and I keep pouring it, pouring it, pouring it, pouring it. It overflows, overflows, gets diluted, diluted, diluted. It's getting clearer, you know. It's a little experiment, but it works for your mind. That clear water is the water of God's word. It's because of the washing of water by the word. You can wash your mind. That's the word used in Ephesians 5. The washing of water with the word. And gradually, this filthy mind becomes pure. And very often, we cannot hear God clearly. We can't get revelation on his word because our mind is so filthy. That's the devil's aim in polluting it with pornography and not only pornography, you can have bitterness and jealousy and an unforgiving thing, attitude in your mind. That's enough to pollute you. With women, it may not be pornography. It may be some jealousy. It may be an unforgiving spirit. It may be a bitterness against someone that's polluted your mind. And you dream about having fights with that person. 
or you toss around in bed wondering what you're going to say next when you meet that person. Get rid of it. We can have a pure mind, even if it was totally filthy once, if I am convinced about the love of God for me. Love those who don't love you. Bless those who curse you. Don't be a Pharisee looking down at other Christians and saying, Lord, I thank you, I'm not like them who don't have the light that I have. You sisters who dress modestly, don't say, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like those other sisters there who don't dress modestly. Or, Lord, I thank you, my daughters are not like that sister's daughters who don't dress modestly. You're a stinking Pharisee. That's all you are. And Jesus will say, how will you escape the damnation of hell? You Pharisee who looked down on others. That poor publican went home justified. The Pharisee missed the bus altogether. Do you hear that preached in your church? Not likely. <laughs> There's hardly any preaching against legalism. As sin. God loves you. Keep your mind pure. Fill your mind with that. There's a lovely verse in the book of Jude. And maybe I'll close with that. In the book of Jude, you know that wonderful verse. Which says... He is able to keep you from falling, from stumbling, verse 24, and present you faultless. That's what Jesus is able to do. I praise God for that. He is able to keep you from stumbling like Eve. If you open your eyes to the tactics of Satan, and one day he'll present you faultless in the presence of his glory, but there's something you have to do. Verse 21. Keep yourselves. It's one thing for Jesus to keep you. That's verse 24. But before he keeps you, it says you keep yourself in the love of God. Then Jesus will keep you from stumbling. Christians have a great habit of taking verses completely out of context. How many of you knew before today that before it says Jesus will keep you from falling, it says you've got to keep yourself in the love of God. That's the verse the devil won't let you read. And that's why you keep stumbling and falling. And you say, why doesn't Jesus keep me from stumbling and falling? Even though it's written, he'll keep me from stumbling and feeling. Read the whole paragraph, brother. You keep yourself in the love of God first. Get rid of all that bitterness and unforgiving spirit from your mind first. Throw it away. Like you throw away the trash from your kitchen. Throw away the trash you have accumulated in your mind, not just, would you keep trash in your kitchen for one year? How long we have kept some trash in our mind? Throw it away today, if you have never done it before. All unforgiving attitudes towards any human being in the world. You will not enter God's kingdom if you haven't forgiven one person. Because Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, you will not be forgiven. Keep yourself in the love of God. Love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Did you hear that somebody cursed you and spoke evil about you? Bless him. Release those people who did evil to you. Don't catch them by their throat. Lest the matter be reported to the king and you be hauled up before him who forgave you all your sins. And he puts you back into prison. Keep yourself in the love of God. That means very simple. Lord, I want to meditate on how much you love me. I want to keep myself there. You love me eternally. There are 101 things I cannot explain. But one thing I know, you love me, Lord. I'll never doubt that. No matter what happens. No matter what happens to me or my family or other people. No matter what happens, your love, there's some things that are absolutely unshakable, unchangeable. God's eternal love for me. And I keep myself in that. And as I keep myself in that, I find it very easy to love those who hate me. Because 
My Savior loved me when I hated him. Easy to forgive others because my Savior forgave me a million times more than what this guy did against me. I want to ask you a straight question. Is there anybody sitting here who's not forgiven someone? Anywhere? Somebody in your mind you haven't forgiven, you say that's a horrible thing that person did against me or my family or my daughter. I don't care what it is. If you do not forgive others, the word of God is true. You will surely die. Your heavenly father will not forgive your transgressions. Keep yourself in the love of God. God loves you immensely. He does not want anybody to perish. He wants all to come to repentance. He wants everybody to be saved. 1 Timothy 2 says, saved from an unforgiving spirit. Saved from bitterness against others. Keep yourself in the love of God. And if you need help, ask Jesus. Lord, help me. Ask him to fill you with the spirit of God. Romans 5 says, 5, 5 says, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. It's one of the wonderful things that happened to me when God filled me with the Holy Spirit. He filled my heart with love for my enemies, for those who hated me, those who persecuted me. I couldn't do it myself. It's like electricity. Without electricity, that light can't burn. And without the Holy Spirit, I can't love. But with the Holy Spirit, I can. And you can. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we pray that you will help us to be aware of the schemes of Satan, to be alert, the warnings you've given us in your word, thank you for them. We know that we can resist the devil at every point and he will flee from us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.